Welcome back to session two. which will get a little bit more philosophical, but hopefully in a, in a helpful way. So how should we think about AI? We were talking about practical ways to think about what really is it, how does it work, um, what goes wrong with it, what are its potentials and limitations. Let's talk now about more philosophical or even theological aspects or implications of AI. And the outline here, the map, for where we're heading is, I'll start with an introduction about how did we get here, meaning the current state of uh, popular opinion or uh, sentiment about what AI is and where it's going, uh, the current state of philosophical confusion, and then I'm going to give two key truths that I hope everyone goes home with these key truths, and I hope that they're convincing. <clears throat> the first is that AIs are fundamentally unlike humans, and they always will be fundamentally unlike humans. A fundamental difference can't be bridged. The second key truth is humans will always be categorically superior to AIs. And if that sounds like a cocky statement, I hope it doesn't by the end of this, because you'll understand what, where I'm coming from when I say that. I'm not saying any one of us is superior to any other. I'm saying we're superior to machines, okay? And there's a reason that I'm saying that that's true. <clears throat> and we should leave here, I hope, believing that. Okay, how do we get here? The current state of philosophical confusion. And I'll go back to our last slide from, from part one, this idea of technological singularity, the idea that there could be, and a lot of people are investing billions in this. They believe that machines will become better than us as thinkers, as creators, <clears throat> that we will be able to invent something that is superior to us. That's the idea of the singularity. Now, this might seem like a 21st century idea that machines can become better than humans. It's actually uh, the idea of thinking machines or human-like machines goes back way further than you probably think. It predates computers. So this is a quote from a book called uh, Erewhon by Samuel Butler. Erewhon is nowhere sort of spelled backward. Slightly. <laughs> he said, <clears throat> this is in 1872. He wrote, either a great deal of action that has been called purely mechanical and unconscious must be admitted to contain more elements of consciousness than has been allowed hitherto. And in this case, germs of consciousness will be found in many actions of the higher machines. Or assuming the theory of evolution, but at the same time denying the consciousness of vegetable and crystalline action, the race of man has descended from things which had no consciousness at all. In this case, there is no a priori improbability in the descent of conscious machines from those which now exist. Okay, that's a mouthful <clears throat> for sure. Now, I don't know exactly how to read this because it's a satirical novel and this this guy had a really sharp wit to him. I don't know if he's lampooning the idea or if he actually believed it. But the thing is, he articulated it in a way that a lot of people today would say, oh, yeah, that's totally true. <clears throat> and if you think about uh, m any movie buffs, if you think about AI and super intelligence and computing intelligence in movies, it goes back a long way. Anybody remember this movie? <clears throat> 2001 Space Odyssey, 1968. So Hal, the onboard computer, and there's a... Uh, I watched it recently with my dog because my wife didn't want to watch it. <clears throat> <laughs> there's an accident where a guy dies out there and, and one of the astronauts goes on a little recovery mission and wants to at least recover the body and he's coming back to the main ship and he needs the computer to open the pod bay doors. Okay. Do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Trouble. Trouble. Do you read me? So what's happened there is the computer 
which has become intelligent, this is a 1968 film, has actually the computer saw a conversation, a secret conversation that two of these astronauts had. They were going to unplug the computer, <laughs> and the computer said, no way, I'm going to let that happen. So he decided, you're not coming back on board. <clears throat> um, so that was way beyond actual computing. There was nothing in real computing that was anything like that in 1968, but people were thinking about it in 1968. They were thinking about it in 1872. Fast forward to Transcendence with Johnny Depp. This is 2014. Please welcome my partner in science and in life, Dr. Will Castor. The path to building superintelligence requires us to unlock the most fundamental secrets of the universe. Imagine a machine with a full range of human emotion. Its analytical power will be greater than the collective intelligence of every person in the history of the world. Some scientists refer to this as the singularity. Professor? I call it transcendence. A series of attacks conducted by a radical anti-tech group known as RIFT. They hit AI labs all over the country. We lost decades of research and development. It's radiation poisoning. The bullet must have been laced with it. The effect is irreversible. Will's body is dying, but his mind is a pattern of electrical signals. We can upload his consciousness. We can save him. Not like this. Assuming that this works, if we missed anything, a thought, a childhood memory, how will you know who you're dealing with? <laughs> Well, my God. I can't feel anything. I'm here. You need to get me online. I need more power. It may be intelligent, it may even be sentient. This is not well. Shut it down. Shut it down? Did. It's him! Your friends crossed the line. They don't know the danger. This is astounding. So how do we fight it? You can't. An AI is like any intelligence. It has needs. The real will died. It'll start to evolve. Where's the machine? To influence them. Perhaps the entire world. Where are you going? Everywhere. <laughs> Okay, his mind is a pattern of electrical signals. We can upload his consciousness. Think about the embedded ideas there, the assumptions. That's Hollywood. <clears throat> this is reality. Anybody know uh, what Neil deGrasse Tyson, actually Elon Musk, Neil deGrasse Tyson, what, what do they claim is true? Anybody know? That takes this to the next level. That we're living in a simulation. Why is that not starting? There we go. Like Mr. Musk thinks, are we living in simulation? I find it hard to argue against that possibility. Meaning? Meaning. You look at our computing power today, and you say, I have the power to program a world inside of a computer. Well, imagine in the future where you have even more power than that, and you can create characters that have, for example, free will or their own perception of free will. So this is a world, and I program in the laws that govern that world. That world will have its own laws of physics and chemistry and biology. Now, you're a character in that world, and you think you have free will, and you say, I want to invent a computer. So you do. Hey, I want to create a world in my computer. And then that world creates a world in its computer. And then you have simulations all the way down. So now you lay out all these universes and throw a dart which of these universes are you most likely to hit? The original one that started it, or the countless simulations, the daughter simulations that uh, unfolded thereafter? You're gonna, hit a sim you're gonna hit one of the simulations. So statistically, based on that argument, which first appeared by a, a philosopher from Oxford named Nick Bostrom back in the 1990s, right when computers were becoming 
real enough to think this through. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to argue against the possibility that all of us are not just the creation of some kid in a parent's basement programming up a world for their own entertainment. And then every time something weird happens in the world, some disruptive leader takes charge, and I wonder if that programmer just got bored and had to stir the pot. So they throw somebody in there just, to, just to, for their own entertainment. For me, that's some of the best evidence that we live in a simulation. Because this happens every time uh, there's peace and tranquility in the world. But if it's true, what can we do about it? If like the Truman movie, or the, was that, we're in that. Yeah, well he can try to escape by going in the Truman movie to go through the barrier. Yeah. But yeah, if, you're, if you were programmed by somebody, yeah, no. There's nothing you can so do. So what difference does it make if I'm programmed by someone? I, I guess it, I don't know it. I guess it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Watch new episodes of Larry King now. <laughs> like Mr. Musk. Okay. Now, so it's comical. You can see actually how he reasons. And Elon Musk gets, the same, gets to the same destination through a slightly different path. Um, but that last question, what difference does it make? I guess it doesn't make any difference. Does it not make any difference if we think we are, if this is all fiction? If we think we're the product of a kid in a parent's basement, would we not live our lives differently than if we under, have a correct understanding of humanity? I think it makes a huge difference, a huge difference. The truth makes a huge difference, the truth about us. So what's at the root <clears throat> of all this confusion? This is from that same uh, built-in web article that I showed a quote from in the first uh, part. This is a quote of a uh, tech uh, CEO named Toby Walsh. It's from last year, 2023. He said, it would be conceited to suppose we won't get to artificial superintelligence. We are just machines ourselves after all. Okay, so that's the philosophy that's behind all this. We are physical things and nothing more. Our brain is a, it's been called a computer made of meat. If a computer made of meat can do the things that humans do, then why wouldn't another computer be able to do that? And if we get it uh, properly programmed, why would it not be able to surpass us, okay? So, but that is a philosophical presupposition. Are we just physical? Well, the, the worldview that claims that we are is called materialism or physicalism. It's the belief that the physical universe is all that exists um, and is very popular among academics. It's very popular among atheists because atheists want to deny everything outside the physical. So it's very popular among scientists, although by no means uh, all scientists hold to this. Uh, but it, it tends to be dominant in scientific conversations because it's the most sort of respected scientific worldview, <clears throat> materialism. There isn't anything other than the physical. So we go back to that Erewhon books, that was Samuel Butler, that was written in 1872. The, his reasoning, if you could parse his rather complex <laughs> statement, is if and only if materialism is correct, then machines can become conscious. And if you flip that, if machines can become conscious, then materialism is correct, okay? And this second one, if you're an atheist, who's betting on your atheism and your materialism, you want to think that machines can become conscious because you think that validates your view of humanity and your view of everything. So there's a lot at stake here and people are not unbiased. There's a, there's a motive for people to want to believe in computers becoming better than us. And this is the motive, it's a worldview motive. Okay, so that's the background, how we got to where we are. Let's look at this first key truth. AIs are fundamentally like, un, un, fundamentally unlike humans. <clears throat> and we're going to um, unpack that in a way that I hope convinces you that this is true. When it comes to the process of, of conversation, here's a good question to ask. Does GT, chat GTP, chat See, I'm a biologist. The GTP is a biological molecule, like ATP. <laughs> GPT is generative pre-trained transformer. And I've switched those. <laughs> Does chat GPT differ from humans only in degree 
or does it differ in kind? If it's degree, you could say, well, chat GPT is, it's above some humans in its ability to write, but it's below your best human writers, but eventually it will be above. That's the way these people are thinking about it. So it's only a matter of degree. But if it's fundamentally different in kind, then it doesn't matter which version, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, 20.0, 10,000.0, .0, it's not gonna be like a human because it's just not the same kind of thing. Well, there are two famous historical computer scientists who had different ideas on this. Uh, one was Alan Turing. The other one is not as famous, but I think she was more brilliant even than Alan Turing, and she was writing a long time before Alan Turing. So this is 1950, Alan Turing. Did anyone see The Imitation Game? That movie came out, that's about this guy. He, so really, The Imitation Game comes from this thought experiment that Alan Turing proposed. He said, suppose that we have a person a machine and an interrogator. The interrogator is in a room separated from the other person and the machine. The object of the game is for the interrogator to determine which of the other two is the person and which is the machine. The object of the machine is to try to cause the interrogator to mistakenly conclude that the machine is the other person. And the object of the other person is to try to help the interrogator to correctly identify the machine. So the idea was it's a purely um, behavioristic, phenomenological account of consciousness or human-like behavior. We have two things um, behind curtain one and curtain two. I'm asking questions of them, and I get answers from behind curtain one and behind curtain two. And we could say the answers are given like in text, so I don't hear, it's not that I can hear a human voice and tell, well, that sounds like a computer voice and that's a human voice, although it's not hard, it's not easy. <laughs> to distinguish between a computer voice and a human voice these days. The idea was if the result is not distinguishable from a human result, then we might as well say computers have become effectively human. But that's a one philosophical take on this. And this is the idea that it's all about degree. Not, it ignores the fact that there could be a difference in kind. Well, these people are all doing the shot put and they're doing it to different degrees. They're doing the same kind of thing to different degrees. It just so happens that Ryan Krauser is the world record holder uh, of the shot put, and these are middle schoolers. Um, they're doing the same thing, just to a different degree. Now, it's possible that one of these middle schoolers will break his record, you know? It's possible. Um, they're not doing a different kind of thing. They're just doing it to a different degree. Contrast this with the view of Ada Lovelace, who was, I think, possibly the most brilliant computer scientist because she was writing computer code in the 1800s before there were computers to code, which is fairly advanced <laughs> when you think about it. <clears throat> she said, if a machine were able to produce creative output in such a way that its programmers are unable to explain how it came up with this output, this would prove that the machine itself is creative. But because this is clearly impossible, machines will never possess their own creativity. That's a profound insight that she made before machines. Now, I know if you put this to some people today, they'd say, well, nobody can explain how chat GPT gives this output. But that's a different, that's not really true in the sense that she means. She means that in principle, even if you had a million people analyzing the code and working through the steps, they could not, they, they would throw their hands up in the air and say, I don't know how ChatGPT did this. That's not true. We know how it did it. It's just that it's going through so many calculations, no human would want to go through all those calculations. But there's no mystery, there's no fundamental mystery as to what it's doing. Now, there are some things that were surprising about ChatGPT when they first did these highly extensive neural nets and they trained them. Um, they didn't know for sure how it would perform, and some of that comes out just by experiment. But when ChatGPT puts out a response, humans know what it did. You can go back and trace exactly what it did. She's saying for a machine to be genuinely creative, its inventors, all these people who know about it, would have to say, I have no idea where it got that idea. And that's not the case for any machine. She says it's utterly impossible, and I, I agree with her. So she's saying that we differ in kind. Humanity is a different kind of thing than machine. And that means degree is not so, forget about degree in the performance thing that Alan Turing was talking about. A machine might be able to pass that test, 
But if it's a different kind of thing, then the test is really irrelevant. So what's this a picture of? What's this a picture of? A, a couple of people that look like they should be at the beach, but doesn't look like they're at the beach, but they're enjoying themselves as, as if they were at the beach. <laughs> those are sculptors, sculptures in a museum done by Ron Muick, who's a hyper-realist sculptor. And the point of this is um, it doesn't matter how, and he's, they, these look very real, <laughs> but it doesn't matter how real the external appearance is. Fundamentally, what he's working on here is always going to be a sculpture and not a human, right? It doesn't matter how much time, it doesn't matter how many people would confuse that for a human if you just show them a picture of it. The fact is it's not a human for fundamental reasons that aren't going to be changed by him spending even more time getting the details right. So difference in kind is profound, right? Much more profound than difference in degree. Okay, just because something answers human questions well doesn't mean it is remotely like a human. And I wanna convince you of that. We're gonna do a couple of thought experiments. I wanna convince you of this by doing this thought experiment. Everyone's familiar with, with FAQs, frequently asked questions or answers to free, frequently asked questions. Let's take, so let's go old fashioned here and imagine a printed piece of paper. Do you know what that is? <laughs> That's an FAQ, it's got questions and answers on it, okay? Now, maybe the answers are really good to the questions and maybe the questions are ones that you were actually wondering about. And in that case, it's a help, helpful FAQ. But when you're holding that paper, do you ever find yourself going, oh my goodness, it's become human? No, no. What you think is some humans who are carefully thinking put this together, and this is the result of the human thinking. This isn't human. The humans are behind it. So let's, let's take this thought experiment to the next level. And suppose, I mean, you've only got 12 questions on your one page FAQ. But suppose you had an FAQ, a monster FAQ, that had, we'll say, we'll say hundreds of billions of questions, all carefully answered by intelligent humans stacked in warehouses by the thousands, trillions of pieces of paper. And we'd even say, we'll take the human out of the equation and say there are, there are robots that when you ask a question, they scan it and they go to the right warehouse, they pull out, pull out the paper, bring back your answer. Uh, it is exactly the same thing in principle as this. It's, it's just this on steroids, right? It's, it's this taken to a new level. If someone were to do this, would you go, ah, oh, these, these warehouses have become human? No. You, you'd say, why have you spent so much time on this FAQ project? This is an impressive scale of effort for an FAQ but you wouldn't confuse the warehouses for being human. Again, the intelligence came from those million human experts who wrote all these hundreds of millions or billions and billions of sheets of paper. Human answers that are intelligent will look intelligent because they're human answers. Okay, but we don't attribute the intelligence to the thing that served up the answer. We attribute it to the people behind it. Okay, now ChatGPT differs from this. It's not an exact analogy, but I think that the analogy still holds or the principle still holds. ChatGPT differs in that it will produce text that no human has ever written, but it does it through an alg algorithm that humans did invent and it was trained on human writing. So it's not, it's not escaping from its human origins. If ChatGPT, to the extent that ChatGPT writes something that you interpret as being intelligent and coherent, it's because of humans, of what humans wrote that it was trained on and what humans did to build the system itself. So in that sense, it's, it's the same as this. Okay, but wouldn't it be nice if we had a proof that computers will never become us? I'm gonna give you such a proof. <clears throat> this is a proof that the human mind isn't and can't be physical. Or another way to put that is, can thought 
really be a physical process because these machines, these computers that are chunking through ChatGPT or DALL-E or Sora or all of the AI that's coming out, they are physical things, right? And they've been set up by humans to do something clever, like to think the domino run, but they're just physical things. And if they're physical things and thought isn't really a physical process, then they're not actually thinking the way a human is. So you could have a conversation with a human who doesn't really know all that much about the subject you're interested in, but at least it's a real conversation where this person's thinking and you're thinking, okay? <clears throat> Whereas an AI is not doing that. I'm going to prove this through a category of argument that's called, um, that depends upon something called self-defeating propositions. And these are a simple example of a self-defeating proposition. It is what it sounds like. It's a statement that, if you take it to be true, says that it's false, <clears throat> okay? Nothing is certain. Nothing is certain, okay? If nothing is certain, then why did you pound your fist on the podium? Because <laughs> that's not certain. Okay, so that's a self-defeating proposition. This is less obviously so, but I'm claiming that brains think is a self-defeating proposition. The claim that the physical gray matter in your head is thinking is a self-defeating proposition. And I'm going to show you that this is true by depending upon this principle. It's the principle of the fallacy of self-validation. And it goes like this. If the validity of X, whatever it is, if the validity of X is in question, then X cannot provide the answer. Do you see why that's true? Right? So take a person like, I don't know if this person's a liar or not. Are you a liar? No. Okay? Right? <laughs> If you're wondering whether Jim is a liar, don't ask Jim, ask someone else, <laughs> right? And this is just a general principle. Because, because X is in question, we have to appeal to something other than X to get a verdict on X, okay? So keep that in mind. Here's how this argument goes. Human thought is an exercise that we all engage in. Um, but it turns out there are certain things that we have to assume to be true in order to take thinking seriously, in order to take this project seriously, right? We have to um, assume that it's basically valid for humans to think. And that's not the same thing as assuming that all humans are thinking correctly or that all human thinking is valid. It means we need to assume that it's not a complete waste of time for us to engage in thought, that we're not utterly, utterly deluded, that we're not absolutely insane basically. And so if X is human thought, and, and you should actually take this in the first person, right? Because part of what I think is that you're out there, but I think that, okay? And I have to assume that I can think, because if I can't think, then you're not out there. <laughs> or you, you saying it to me, I'm not here, okay? So our sanity is something that we have to take to be true in order to go anywhere in thinking, and you can't prove it. Because if my sanity is the X, I can't ask me whether I'm sane. And I can't ask you, because if I'm so insane that you're not even there, then you're not going to give an answer. So we have to start ground zero by assuming we take on faith that it's valid for humans to think, that it's not a waste of time for humans to think, that if humans get together and think collectively carefully, it's possible for them to get to the truth. Not a surefire path. We can think incorrectly, but it's not a complete waste of time. The thing is, we can't use human thinking to validate that because human thinking is the X. Is human thinking valid? Don't ask humans, okay? And we don't have anyone else to ask right here, okay? So we put a check over that just because we take on faith. We have to take this on faith, right? So a starting point for all humans, and we don't even, this isn't something that, that we do introspectively. We just automatically assume that this is true. But it is a faith assumption. It is a faith position. Science depends on that faith position. So if you ever hear someone say that science is over here and faith is over here and science has no need of faith, that's not true. <laughs> because if humans can't think, they can't do science. And we had to use faith to assume that humans think. Doing science, there's another thing that we have to take on faith. And again, if science is the X, we can't ask science whether science is valid, right? We have to not only assume that on faith that humans can think, but we have to assume, any, can anyone think of what, 
Suppose we all say, okay, we're going to take on faith that we can think that that's valid. What else do we have to assume to be true to do science? Science is thinking about this, this, this is outside world. Yeah. That it's even there, that there's an objective world out there that I can go and examine and say things about and commun communicate them to you and you can go check my uh, what I said and see if it's true. That's how you do science. We're, we're all assuming there is an outside world that we can talk about and examine and, and describe. And if that's the X, the, the outside world, I can't say, yes, there's an outside world. Look, here's my ball of art. Well, you, you've appealed to the X. <laughs> Again, there has to be something outside of the outside world that validates that there is an outside world. So we take it to be true on faith. There is no scientific experiment that can prove that there's an outside world. Because guess what? If there isn't, that experiment's not valid. <laughs> okay? So you assume there is an outside world with objective properties. And we all do this naturally. Scientists don't even talk about this, right? So having taken these two faith positions that we, we take to be true entirely on faith, not because we can prove that they're true, we embark upon science. And science is all about coming up with explanations uh, of the natural world. <clears throat> so let's uh, assume we've done this and we have a particular explanation. And let's say that there's just broad agreement in a whole discipline of science that this is a true thing and it makes its way into college and high school textbooks and AP biology students learn about this. Um, you're just expected to know this and it's true. So it's part of kind of orthodox thinking in a scientific field. Um, so we could call it scientific in that sense. But suppose this orthodox view has implications for our faith in human thought, and suppose the implications are negative. That if we took this view to be true, we should abandon our faith in us as thinkers. Then we should abandon science, because if we can't think, we can't do science, and we should abandon the explanation. So do you see how this would be a self-defeating proposition? I'm going to show you that brains think is exactly this. Because you're AP biology, if you look at anatomy, if you look at what is the brain, this is the view that your brain is the thinker. It's the thing that's thinking. We are just material. But if you take that seriously, it should make you abandon your faith in human thinking, which means all everything's gone. There is no science, there are no brains, there is nothing. There aren't textbooks, it's all gone. So it works like this. <clears throat> Imagine yourself in a future high-tech brain imaging lab that has technology beyond anything that we actually have today. And you're conscious and there are probes on your scalp and there are uh, displays all around the room and there are scientists around you who are materialists who believe there is nothing other than the material. There is no immaterial realm. Everything that exists is physical. Um, and they're convinced of that. <clears throat> and they're able to, in real time, as you're thinking and doing things and dialoguing with them, in real time, image and display on these displays absolutely everything that's happening inside your head, everything in your brain, down to, we'll say, the molecular level. This You can't actually do this, but it's a thought experiment. So everything they can capture, anything in your brain that's happening and show you on these displays. <clears throat> and these scientists have asked you, they're interrogating you, they're asked you to count to 10 and to meditate on the numbers as you count to 10. And you say, okay, one, two. And they snap this image when you say two and it shows um, activation of the frontal lobe region of the brain. And they say, is, stop right there. Is this what you mean when you say two? And what do you say? Is that what you mean by two? No. You say no. <laughs> and you say, I'm not denying that my frontal lobe was activated. Sure, that's fine. That's not what I mean by two. Maybe I'm using my frontal lobe when I'm talking about numbers. That's not what I mean by two. They say, wait, let's, let's drill in here. <clears throat> This synapse, this particular synapse fired when you said two. Is that what you mean by two? And you say, no. 
maybe the synapse fired. <laughs> That's not what I mean by two. And maybe I need to have synapses firing while I'm talking about numbers. That's not what I mean by two. And they start to get angry with you because everything that they're putting on these displays that's happening in your brain, physical stuff in your brain, they keep saying, is this what you mean by two? And you say, no, none of these are what I mean. Is there anything that's in your brain that they could display? And you say, that's it. That's what I mean when I say the number two. No, why not? Because number two is a, it's an idea. It's not a physical thing, right? Like, most of the words we're using are referring to ideas, not physical stuff. There isn't anything in my brain that is what I mean when I say to, or between, or love, or around, all, or circle. All these things that we're using, terms that we're using, refer to ideas, and ideas are not physical. And if these scientists say, well, you're wrong because there isn't anything that isn't physical. This is a physical universe. There's nothing beyond the physical. So if your words mean anything, the meaning has to be here in your brain. Um, and then you would say, well, then I'm very confused because I think I'm saying things that mean something else. So if I follow the materials by doubting my conscious experience, I'm forced to doubt absolutely everything. Why? Because I don't have access to anything except through my conscious experience, right? So if they're saying you're wrong about the meaning of the words you're using, about the way you think you're thinking, then you should step back and say, then I have no idea what's going on here. I have no confidence in my thinking because you're saying I'm confused fundamentally. But if I'm confused, I have, well, I have these two options. Either I'm not confused or I am. Either A, I'm doing what I think I'm doing. So I'm manipulating concepts which are non-physical when I think that's what I think I'm doing, right? If you're doing math, you're working with ideas. Or B, I am being manipulated by neurons. I'm being tricked. So manipulated in the first sense is the positive sense. I'm working with ideas, fashioning ideas. That's what I think I'm doing when I think. But if you're telling me, no, I'm being duped, negative sense of manipulated. I'm being tricked, duped into thinking that's what I'm doing. Neurons are sending up signals that are making me think I'm working with ideas. But if that's true, then I'm, I'm toast. I can't think, right? I'm totally confused. So I lose my faith in thinking altogether because I'm totally duped. Why would I believe this? And I lose science and I lose materialism and I lose this idea that my brain is doing my thing. I lose neurons, I lose scientists, I lose labs, I lose it. This is all, this is all the delusions of an insane, I don't even know I exist, right? It all becomes insanity. B, self-destructs. And that leaves us with a I am manipulating concepts which are not physical. This is the only coherent understanding of humanity. There is no coherent physicalist account of humanity. It's utterly incoherent at the base. Okay? How do they get away with this? Only because most people don't trace our, they don't trace knowledge all the way back and ask these fundamental questions. Everyone just assumes it, and then we move on. That's how you get here, is by not going all the way back. The fact is, you need to land on a worldview that supports your basic faith positions that, you, that thinking is valid, that you exist, and that there is a real world. You need to land on a worldview that supports those and doesn't clash with them, and materialism clashes with them, okay? And any... any worldview that clashes with your basic foundational assumptions is going to be an incoherent worldview. So we are left with a little bit of music going on. <laughs> Bad to the bone. Okay. Uh, this is the only coherent view of humanity that we, yes, we do have immaterial physical bodies. We have those, but we're not just that. There has to be this mental realm in which we do our thinking, and the two have to be brought together. So um, I'm thinking in a mental realm. Uh, I'm thinking I'm going to lift up this water. Uh, there's a lot that has to happen in order for me to lift the water, but I just, it just works. For some people, it doesn't work, right? 
But for me, it just works. Hand, go there, lift the water up, boom. But do I know how to run a brain? I have no idea how to run a brain. <laughs> I have no idea what it just happened in my brain. I just thought, hand, lift the water, and it worked. There's a lot that's going on in the motor cortex, all this stuff. But someone knew that I wanted to do that. Someone knows my thoughts before I think them, is living up there, is right with me up there, and moves it. When I'm going to motion, when I'm intending motion, someone who gets both of these moved it into my brain, and it becomes muscle motion, and the water goes up. And like I said, there are people who want to lift the water who can't. It's not that they're doing anything different up there. It's that there's something in the brain that's interrupting that process. Okay, so who is the someone? It has to be God. It has to be someone who is in charge of the physical and knows my thoughts before I think them. God has to be the one who's with you and moves these thoughts when they become actions so that the body responds. And it works the other way too, because you saw me lift the water and that's photons coming from the light, landing on your retina, going through the optic nerve to the visual center in the brain. Uh, but the brain didn't see me lift the water. It's like this beautiful, beautifully designed processor. And at some point, someone who knows everything about that brain and knows you and is in there with you has to go, here, here's a vision. Here's red. Here's, you know, all these colors you see. Here it is. And that has to be, God is the only mediator between mind and medicine. This is a proof that God is right there. If you ever think he's not there with you, lift up the water. And if you can't do that, <laughs> do anything. He is right there with you because otherwise this doesn't work, okay? There is no physicalist, no coherent physicalist understanding of humanity. The second key truth is humans will always be categorically superior to AIs. This will never change, okay? And for that, let's take this picture of humanity and um, consider just a simple communication task. So here I said, because I'm a professor, so it's students. Did you finish this statis the statistics homework? So it could be that someone wrote that out on a note and passed it, and you're in the statistics class where you should have finished the homework, <laughs> or it could be that they spoke those words to you. What's actually happening here in terms of process? The person who's asking the question thinks of the question, hey, I'm gonna ask Gina if she did this. Uh, you either vocalize it, or you wrote, write it down, and that involves God transferring your thoughts when you, at the point where you're physically acting to your body and you're doing either making vocalizations or writing something. And then it happens the other way over here. Gina hears what you said or reads off your note. It's either coming through her eyes or her ears, gets processed through the brain, and then it's handed up and she hears or she sees. And, and then she understands. She knows what you asked and then she replies. Con contrast this with a conversation with ChatGPT. With ChatGPT, it looks like this. Same, same thing. You have an idea. It's moved into body motion. You put something into physical form. The physical form is text that goes to ChatGPT. But now there's nothing, there's no idea bubble here. <laughs> it is pure machine. And the machine comes back with something that sounds coherent as a chat bot. I don't have homework. Can I help you with something else? That's some, you'll get something like that if you ask chat GPT this. But there's a profound difference between this and this. Because here, there are, there's an idea that's being transmitted from one thinker to another. And here, you're the only one with the idea. And even if the, you asked it something else, like, tell me about the civil, American Civil War. Uh, it will give you, you know, pages that it got from, you know, its training. But there's no thinking going on there. It is simply a machine that's turning the crank and giving you something. Um, so it is profoundly different. And it is inferior in this sense. You, you may, if you had a seven-year-old and you asked them about, tell me about the American Civil War, unless they're a Civil War buff at the age of seven, which there are some, <laughs> most seven-year-olds would probably not be able to tell you much. And ChatGPT will run circles around them in terms of what text it produces. But in terms of an actual conversation of meeting of minds, 
you're doing better with the seven-year-old because the seven-year-old at least heard you and has an idea of what you're asking and gives you a response that is two human minds connecting. Whereas with ChatGPT, it's not that at all. It's categorically different. So the profound value of language is that it enables thoughts to be transmitted from one thinker to another through physical tokens. And those physical tokens can be vibrations of the air, speech and hearing, or written words or any sign language, all kinds of things are, we're using physical stuff, smoke signals, to convey ideas from one thinker to another. Mere manipulation of tokens doesn't even participate in this process. So ChatGPT, despite the fact that it's spitting out paragraphs, it is not actually using language. It is simply using the tokens of language. It doesn't actually have this connection to thought. And it's only because of the human, huge human element that went into it that it gives the appearance of doing thought. A young child starting to speak, so think of a, you know, a two-year-old, is doing something far more profound than chat GPT will ever do. atheist physicalist and he has something called the cosmic inversion and in his book uh, Darwin's dangerous idea I think it's called he says classically we think of God being on top God made humans human make things humans make things so it's a he calls it the cosmic pyramid but he says Darwin inverted the cosmic pyramid and puts uh, material stuff on top. The material stuff made humans, humans made God. <laughs> that, that's the inversion. So he says, why should the importance or excellence of anything have to rain down on it from on high, from something more important, a gift from God? Darwin's inversion suggests that we abandon that presumption and look for sorts of excellence, of worth, and purpose that can emerge bubbling up out of mindless, purposeless forces. Now, what I would say is true here and it is important to recognize is there is a connection between Darwin's theory and this. There is something philosophical about Darwin's theory. It is an attempt to remove God and say that the small and the insignificant can produce the significant. It produced us. That's the lie. That's a very, very dangerous lie if you believe that. Compare that with uh, this. This is Romans 9, 20 and 21. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? <clears throat> Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and, no and another for dishonorable use? So the clear teaching of scripture is we are God's handiwork and he is above us, categorically, profoundly above us. So the picture that scripture gives us is something like this. God made us and we made AI, okay? So the idea, the idea that AI will become better than us is a profane and blasphemous <laughs> inversion of the truth because the creator is always better, bigger, superior to the creation. And if we think we can make something better than us, we're saying that we're better than God. So if we go back to that quote that I don't have here from, or do I have it at the beginning here? If we go back to this, I think this is a inversion. No, it's this one where Toby Walsh said, it would be conceited to suppose we won't get artificial and super, intellig super intelligence. We are just machines ourselves after all. No, 
it's actually conceited to think that we will produce something superior to us because the creator is always better than the thing it creates. And if you think you can make something equal to us or better than us, you think you're better than God. And that's profoundly, profoundly conceited.